Okay. Looks like we're live on YouTube. So welcome to Dive Into World Building. <laughs> this week, uh, we are back after a, a break for the fall holiday. And, um, and we are talking about what's on the page. Um, so actually, so this is a question that is really, really important. Uh, a lot of people, um, a lot of people dive into their world building and they create these massive world Bibles and, and they have all these details and they have maps and they have all this kind of stuff. And then the world, when they write the story turns out to be kind of flattened, that there's a lot missing from the page, right? Mm -hmm. um, massive world planning and shallow world on page is a problem, right? And um, <clears throat> the first thing that I always recommend is having somebody read the story who does not know the world very well. Um, because honestly, outside readers are worth their, are worth their weight in gold. <laughs> um, and because they only see what's on the page, right? Right. And if, if you have read Mazes of Power, which, you know, at this point is a small number of people in the world, it will not <laughs> be a small number of people for too much longer, but Paul is among those people. Um, <laughs> then you can kind of see the magnitude of, of the problem of translating the Varan world, which is massively huge and complicated onto a page in a way that allows a reader to, to grasp nuance and depth and, and be able to sense that there's more going on. Um, or even just the small details. Slight spoiler, like for example, the watch and yes. how it counts off. It's like, oh, I saw what you did there, <laughs> which is not too not too spoiler. It's like, oh, that's a nice little bit of world detail you put in there. Just in just Nicanor looking at his watch. Yeah, you, you told you told us something about about how numbers in the world work. Yes, I really appreciate how that worked. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a thing. So, so yeah, numbers in the world are definitely an issue. And we have talked about numbers before, but we are not talking about them right now. But, they, but these little things have to sneak in, right? And so I guess one of the things that's the issue um, is how do you get those important things onto the page? And I think Paul's got the right of it. Little details, right? but they're not random details, they're, they're telling details, right? You have to pick your details carefully um, so that you'll choose the ones that have more dimension, um, the ones that, that show you pieces of the world. Um, one of the things that I do in the book is that all of the numbers that I mention are always multiples of four. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and so that is something that my brain thinks in multiples of five. Um, and I will sometimes have to catch myself on this, you know, the sixth or seventh draft. Wait, wait, I left a five in there. <laughs> Got to fix that. Um, and it's not as though the, the, the quantity of five minutes doesn't exist. Um, but um, four minutes when it exists, exists in it's our actually world. a marked thing. It's an exact measurement, right? If you measure five minutes in Varan, that's because it's an exact measurement of five minutes. Whereas if you're estimating, you're always going to estimate four minutes, eight minutes, 12 minutes, 20 minutes, that kind, of, that kind of thing. Nobody in our world says four more minutes, mom. We just say five more minutes, mom. <laughs> right. Exactly. Varen, yes. They say four more minutes, Varen, mom. You would say four more minutes, mom. <laughs> yeah. So that's an important and fairly subtle thing. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, 
so you have to find places where that kind of stuff lends itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that was great. <laughs> I don't think anybody has said that yet. <laughs> but it, it's, but it's but you're not wrong. <laughs> it's, it's, that's, I mean, that's a huge part of it, right? Is, mm -hmm. is that, you know, that's, that's why you're switching to fours and fives because. Right. Right. And there, and, and another one of those, another one of those things. Okay. So I'll, I'll tell you two more things um, that I think are kind of like that. One of them is mom, can I borrow your Aloran? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, so the way you do names like mother's Aloran or yeah. Yeah. Or father's Soren. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because the Mbati all have these people that they're associated with, and so they're associated with them in their official titles as and, well. And, and, then, and then you did it even more subtly when you talk, because uh, first of all, Lauren isn't, and then when he finally gets refer reference to that, that's a, that's, a, that's a milestone in his relationship. Yeah. <laughs> when he actually, when he, when that actually gets a pelt, when he gets addressed that way rather than just as Lauren. And, right. then you do, and then you do it elsewhere with, well, spoiler, redacted, spoiler. <laughs> later on <laughs> yeah <laughs> but oh God, like when, I, I was, God, when i was thinking about that scene with the can i borrow your lauren there's a lot that goes into that because it's also can i borrow the car mom mm -hmm. right so it's so it's supposed to evoke several things one of which is the teen asking for the uh, for the for a for a something that will allow him to be mobile right Mm -hmm. um, the and caste system, the social system, <laughs> right? How but it also, yeah. but it also implies the way that the titles work, which implies the way that the caste system works, and all this other stuff. So, mm -hmm. it has several layers of information in it, right? And I mean, especially for a short story, that's absolutely positively. You have to, or you're not going to finish the story. In a novel, I mean, you can you can be more leisurely, but I do appreciate when a novelist like yourself can manage can fine tune that, like like jeweled hands in a watch. You you don't spend ten pages to explain language. You, you yeah. do it in the small things, and the reader the, the reader has to pick up on it and, and grab it. Right, and some people find that hard. Yeah, it, it, it's de it's definitely hard. There are people who prefer the wall of words. <laughs> and that's the way they get the information rather than the I'm small I'm going to sit you details. down and tell you how this works now. <laughs> it, yes, I, I, I mean, I've read plenty of novels like that. That's, that's the way some writers write and some readers want that. Whereas, mm -hmm. other, I mean, I think, I think maybe you coming from also a short story tradition, you're, you're more finely tuned to economy. Well, economy okay, so words the economy thing, I did work for a very long time on trying to get my trying to get my stories to be shorter, which was an economy question. But um, part of it is that I'm coming out of um, linguistics and discourse analysis. Mm, yeah, One of the things that I found the most fascinating about linguistics and discourse analysis was studying how people hide information in what they say. So if you put something in a subordinate clause, it's almost like it's hidden because it's been demoted in, in importance relative to the rest of the sentence. And your brain is more likely to just accept it and skip over it. To, to, go, to go political for a second, the first words of the second amendment or, mm. or, sub, or subordinate clause right at the beginning people, and lots of people yep. skip right over them, right into the, into the meat of it. Right, so, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's one of my, like, you don't want to have, you, you want to have some variation in the length of your sentences and you don't want to have everything be too heavy with subordinate clauses. But I do tell people, if you want to hide some information in plain sight, stick it in a subordinate clause. Um, yeah. Um, so the other example that I wanted to that I wanted to bring up is the one where it's like, well, you're going to help me with this. And the response is when the sun rises in Palasmara. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it. I love translating idioms into a completely different context. 
right? Yeah. Um, because the sun's never going to rise in Pelosnoir <laughs> unless the roof fell in, <laughs> and it would all be on the top levels. But like, so I kind of try to find a place where you've got something somebody would say that's very, very sort of emotionally fraught and interesting, and then tweak it a little bit. Conflict is such a great place to hide information. Um, and I've said this before on the show, but like, it's worth saying again, because you never know who might be watching this one. Hey, this uh, conflict the first is episode. a great way to hide information. Yeah, because um, that, that, that particular thing is, isn't, isn't necessarily telling you so much you know, what the the what the <clears throat> it's the combination of the phrasing the pattern mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. and yeah I really need more sleep um, yeah. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> if you know if you already know that that is basically saying never um mm -hmm. right then because it tells you something about the sun the sun's setting sun rising um yeah i'm sorry uh no, if so, you don't so know that places. you see the the emotion from right the phrasing just right because it's a pattern that matches right and so you as a reader would recognize the social context of what's being said yeah and so you would understand what the import of the thing being said is. And then mm -hmm. if there's a mismatch between what's literally being said and what you expect, that's okay. Cause you sort of, you sort of then correct yeah. to say, oh yeah, that's what this means. And it means it in this context. And then by the way, it also means that that, that <laughs> some thing is never gonna happen in California. <laughs> right, right. Um, it's also that same exact, that same exact thing. The, the support of context is why the first sentence of the book is Taggart believed in music the same way he believed in the sky. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know. I think, I, I think I'm going to say this is an information density question, but I like high information density. <laughs> I've noticed. <laughs> <laughs> um there's there's a lot there and and if you read it again you'll probably find that there's still more there <laughs> yeah I, I i i imagine that yeah i've missed things in this, in this <laughs> um, that's good that that the right. that rewards are reread right but so like part of the point is that you want to open with something that's going to reveal something about a character and also something about what's about to happen. And it's also supposed to make you curious. And it would be really helpful if we knew everybody lived underground. <laughs> right? So like, hmm, how do you put that all together? And I tell you, it took me a long, long time to find that sense. A long, 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 long time. I had to come back to the beginning of that multiple times and go, mm -hmm. <laughs> And then I finally was like, ah, ah. I found it, Eureka. <laughs> Eureka. But yeah. Without running running naked through the streets of Syracuse. <laughs> no, no, that's not recommended. <laughs> no, that that's really, that's really the original Eureka Eureka story. Oh really? <laughs> yes, Archimedes got figured 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 out the a, a, a problem. He ran out of the bath naked, saying, "Eureka, I found it." Nice. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Not realizing well, you know, it was close. But but it must be said that 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 bathing is good for brain for brain function <laughs> oh, well yeah <laughs> <laughs> so yep um okay so what am i saying okay we sidetracked because we got onto my book and i'm very excited about my book i must tell you i'm very well, but, but yeah but your book is useful for useful for probing these questions and your book is coming so i'm happy so that's fair right that. That, is fair. that is fair um so, so, okay. And this actually, you could probably see this as an extension of the white rooms uh, discussion in a sense, mm -hmm. because you don't want to be putting people in a place that's not, um, 
that's not where you can't where the context cannot be understood right so you right. there's context on a whole bunch of levels um Context on multiple levels. So you have any word that you put on your page has its own raft of connotations, right? But the, the meaning that it, it gets assigned in the story has to do with what comes around it, right? And so, for example, um, gosh, um, I don't want, I don't want to pull out an example. Okay. So, so the word surprise, mm -hmm. right. Um, by itself, surprise, <laughs> right. Um, it can go either way. It can be a really good thing or it can be a really bad thing. Right. And what that import depends on is how you set it up. So if, you know, if you've done research on what your, on your friend's availability on what they like and you've, and you've gotten all their favorite people together and you've got streamers and all the things that they like, it could be a fantastic thing, right? Right. <clears throat> um, but, you know, I'm going to destroy your mother's life. Don't tell her because it's a surprise. Mm -hmm. um, no, completely different. Yeah. So that kind of control, I mean, that's a really simple example, um, but that kind of control is something that the author has when writing, right? Um, you set up the context of what a word means and you can completely flip what a word means inside the context of your story. If you really want to, you have to put the effort in, right? Mm -hmm. But like, um cold words that i wrote a long time ago <laughs> cold and warm had these very different meanings right so um there was cold and warm the literal meanings which we share and then there was cold and warm the emotional meanings that we kind of share right the cold being sort of cruel and, and bad and warm being kind of nice but then in the in that particular story I had to teach people about some aliens who thought that cold meant it was um, exalted or powerful and warm meant um, lowly and dirty, right? Mm -hmm. And I had to add those meanings onto the pre-existing meanings of cold and warm that were being used that, that are more familiar to readers, right? Right, right. So in order to do that, you have to put that on the page. That's my point, <laughs> right? Yeah. The context that you create is created by the words that you choose on the page. So um, you know, adding meanings to things, et cetera. And it, and it contributes to, it contributes to the import. So like anything that you put at the start of a story contributes to the, the impact that's gonna be had by the same words later in the story. Right. <clears throat> so. Okay, so what else are we gonna talk about with on the page? Um, have you ever had a critique where you were like, what did this person even see? Like you really felt like this person just didn't get the story. Hmm. Well, uh, yeah, well, that, that goes to the whole idea of, I mean, the external readers are good because they're not seeing any, like, they're, they're not seeing what's in your head. So they're, right. they're just, they're just seeing the, the quote unquote cold dead words. I mean, you have, you have an idea of how this care, how these characters go, what this world is like, what this all means. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you, you as the author has preconceptions that the, that a re, an external reader just does not have. All they have to deal with, unless they sit down at the bar and talk to you for an hour about your world, all they have is the world. So they're seeing it with a external perspective that can can, in a positive positive sense, show that 
okay, maybe the stuff that you think you've written down and actually put in there isn't actually there to be found because you're just, you have it in your brain, but you didn't actually translate it to actual right. words on yeah. the page. Thing is that there's there's got to be some, you have to know something about what the reader can and can't, the, what the reader can and can't see in any book because sometimes you'll, you'll get a reader who looks at a story and doesn't see anything at all of what you've, what you've put in. Right. Not necessarily because you haven't put it in and it's not on the page, but because for some reason they, they don't, they can't imagine that such a thing, they can't even get close to imagining. Right. This thing actually, close enough to right, me. and I think that's actually important to to realize because just because we think we've put something on the page doesn't necessarily mean it's there, right? Yeah, right. Um, so we think it's there, but it's not is definitely uh, one problem that you can have. Um, but there's also there's the also problem. we think it's not there, but it is, <laughs> right? Yeah, or the yes. reader can't doesn't see it even though it is there. And you can't tell because you wrote it. So, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. what you do, if you get three readers and two of them see a thing and the third <laughs> doesn't. Right. And it actually, this, this links up to the question of word meanings <clears throat> because word meanings are things that are established by us encountering words in different contexts over time. Mm-hmm. And so if we haven't ever encountered a word in that context before, we're going to struggle to put it in that context, in this context, in this, in this, on this occasion. Right. Yes. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why you have readers with very different um, social experiences. Or cultural ones, like for example, or cultural experiences. So, yeah. yeah. Well, like, like, for example, so as you, you throw the word, you th have a conversation in a story. It's like, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Paul, he's a putz and you don't, <laughs> you don't explain that. I mean, someone in the East Coast of New York, well, they'll know exactly what it is, but someone in Oregon may have no clue that you did, that, that was a put down unless you have something built around that. So yeah, the, expert, yeah. the, the reader just doesn't have that experience <clears throat> of that being a, an insult. Right. And so every reader is going to come to the words on the page differently, right? Mm -hmm. Because what they're going to bring with them is the context in which they've seen the sort of pieces of which the whole is made. Um, because I've said this before, but I'm gonna say it again, because it's really important. <laughs> we don't get messages from words, right? The, the words wake up things that we've, that we remember, right? The meanings of words are, are composed of our experiences. And so we don't receive a message. The thing that the person had in their head when they were writing these words on the page is not the same thing that you are experiencing in your head when you see that same constellation of words, right? Um, yep. But what you're doing is you're evoking and you're hoping that you guys have enough shared experience that you're gonna be evoking something similar. <laughs> right, so you can meet somewhere along the road to the story that you're trying to tell. Right. And that's why everybody gets something different from a story. Now that gets trickier when you're using invented words, when you, when you're kind lagging, because right. you, you as the writer have created this word, this object, like, uh, I'm going to miss like, like the musical instrument. I, I can't pronounce it because you, I think you took uh, some of the etymology from Japanese you know exactly what that is, but you have to describe it to the, be the reader so I can get what that actually, a, mm -hmm. a vision of it. And my vision is probably still not exactly what yours is because you created this thing and I did not. I just have to go from what's actually on the page. Mm -hmm. This is actually interesting because, um, <clears throat> well, so there, anytime you're conlanging, that's definitely something that you run into, right? Anytime you invent a word, but like, even when it's not called conlanging, right? But when it's like, and we've spoken about this before, but when it's like, um, my brain just blanked the word. <laughs> that was helpful. Um, uh, the things you get food out of in Star Trek. 
Replicators? Replicators, right? That's not really strictly speaking conlanging, except that you have invented a thing that you've just given an English like name to. Um, and you have to establish what that is. So even when you're not strictly speaking conlanging, <clears throat> even when you have existing pieces of meaning that you're making use of in the original you know, language of the text, whatever that may be, you're still having to do that contextual work and say, well, a skimmer is a thing that looks like a moped, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> and mm -hmm. then it has these features and it has, doesn't have these other features. Right. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And so, then, you can, then you can go to the even second level if you're really, really weird and take other people's previously created words and then go. Or like Ansible, my gosh. Well, that that's exactly what, exactly what I was thinking. Exactly that's what I was thinking of. For ages, I thought that was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I was like, why have I never heard of this? It's obviously everywhere. <laughs> I only, yeah, I only really recently read the Le Guin novel where it's invented. It was only like invented like 1869. And she yeah. invented the word and now everybody just uses and reuses it like it's a thing. But they're also, <laughs> right. but they're, um, they're not all the exact same dev looking device. There, there are variations and twists and changes, but yeah. Right. Can we go back to Replicator for a second? Sure. sure. So in Star Trek, Replicator is a food thing yeah a good thing you can replicate you know your cup of tea um if you move universes to stargate oh right those aliens right the, the, the self-replicating aliens i didn't even think of those right morgan you're so right you do not want to get involved with replicators that's a replicator <laughs> you don't want that's yeah right. um, <laughs> so yeah. what do they do uh, they basically uh, disintegrate things and take take you apart and um, they they replicate. They're, 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 they're von Neumann, yeah, they're the von Neumann machines. Okay. And they Nasty. they they replicate and uh, it gets very complicated and they have human form replicators and and. And all that, but the the just the word replicators is is uh, supposed to make you um, shudder, <laughs> shudder, and say whatever it is you think you're getting into, stop, end it now, nuke it from orbit because it's the only so, way to be sure. And even then, replicators are are pretty hardy. That might not even work. Actually, they. Yeah, I, I yeah. want to say they've done that and it hasn't worked. I, 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 it seems to recall now. I'm thinking back to Stargate. Yeah, I think they tried it once and that that didn't work. <laughs> yeah, I they, still think that firing things into the sun is a good plan. <laughs> it generally is, know. Kate. It generally is. Even replicators can't survive that. Right. I love that Stargate whole arc, though. Oh, I have to obviously <laughs> go find it. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. Um, trying to think what season it starts. Um, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. I have the entire box set, but I all, I watch it all at once, so I don't know. Does so, yeah. <laughs> Daniel die again in one of those those stories? Oh, he, he, he dies for or a is that season. Just an easy... How many times does Daniel die? And no, he, no, but he's, oh? he's he's gone for an entire season, and they had the other guy that he disappears, and Daniel comes back. Right. And he wasn't That's even the original that. guy either, and I'm really happy about that because I did not like the guy from the movie. Oh, uh, <laughs> James. Spader. Oh, Spader. Yeah. Yeah. For but some reason, Spader I have a visceral dislike of that man, so I was like, yay! Well, he generally plays a-holes. That's the problem. Well, this, this, is what I, he, yeah. it, this is a non-a-hole role for him, so it's a little off his base, but we're way off of Juliet's uh, topic. We, yeah, we, we've lost topic. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was probably my fault. No, uh, no. Okay. <laughs> Actually, so so I thought what we could do at this point is, is bring up um, bring up series because series have a very interesting what's on the page problem oh um whenever you start a book that's not the first book in a series how much can you assume people know from previous books in the series right oh yes it's not on the page in this book but maybe you've experienced it on the page in another book and maybe you haven't i yeah. just had that happen but it wasn't in a book 
Mm. Um, there are what we're on season what 19 of Grey's Anatomy. Uh, is this still going? I didn't realize it that. Is. Oh it's, my I god! Season five, and then went back into season three. I still don't know what happened in season one. And to yes, some like, degree, I I need to know that as background. I need to know why this character is responding in an outsized way to this thing that I have only seen them experience once, and I didn't. I don't know that's mm-hmm. happened forty-seven times. But there are people whose work that I will read, and I'll start in the middle because I know it doesn't actually matter. I'm they're mm. a good enough writer that I can just go with it. And if I want to go back and read number one because I want to see what the foreshadowing was and all that stuff, that's great. But there are some people that I'll just I'll just start reading. Um the expanse. Like start anywhere you like. Yeah. So good writing will have contextual support no matter where you jump in, I guess. But yes. the question is how much contextual support do you need? I think it depends I mean, on what the story you're telling. probably idiosyncratic, but... Well, that also depends on the story you're telling. Like, to use The Expanse as an example, starting spoiling, starting with book four, the, the context of, of of humanity is completely different because now you have all these extra worlds, and then there, and then I believe it's the book after, there's a time jump, so mm-hmm. there's different jump bombing on points because the world itself has shifted. Also, going back to Stargate again, you... Since this, since the premise changes a couple of times, you can jump in at a particular season because it's it's tailor made for you to start there. Like when they when they mm. got the when when they got the guy from Farscape to be the, mm-hmm. the leader, mm-hmm. that that was clearly like okay, you can start here now because we're gonna introduce him and tell about him and and start and you can basically start the show from this point rather than having to watch seven seasons first. So mm-hmm. a writer. Um, so a series can be structured that way, or if it's, if a if a series is just a long continual arc, it's a lot more difficult because they have all that back matter to try to either summarize at the beginning of a book or try to have characters think like Jonas thought about his fight against the Dark Lord and how he went to the castle and can be rather kludgy at best and off putting yeah. at worst. To where he's like, I know that that was three books ago. Let's get on with the plot now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and I think two different ones, like Stargate, obviously, but also Chronicles of Shannara, which is one long arc. Mm. Um, And that was actually, there's a huge amount of tension over how those things play off each other early on, like when you you look at Battlestar Galactica, the the first one, um, versus Babylon 5, which had overall arcs, but then it had standalone series, or standalone episodes in there. And then Mm -hmm. all the different Star Treks take different takes on that some of them are really really arc bound some of them are really into their individual storylines i think stargate universe was really all about the arc and a lot of the like we're gonna have this little um episode or two about the interpersonal conflict i to a huge degree i was like i don't care where are we going Mm. so yeah i mean i think it part of what sustains a longer Part of what sustains a longer piece is the existence of arcs at various levels, right? I mean, you don't, it would not be possible uh, in my definition of an arc to have only one arc at a time, right? I mean, because basically for me, three points of repetition of anything constitutes an arc. So you've always got arcs going of all kinds of stuff on various different levels of complexity. Um, but, uh, you know, character arcs and plot arcs and thematic arcs, mm-hmm. all this different kind of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like, well, how many do you have going on at one time? And how do they support each other, I guess? Because if you're missing pieces of one arc, but you're being supported effectively by the rest, maybe you're okay. If you just put too much load on that load-bearing structure, readers will notice. Right. (laughs) And I think that's actually one of the things I don't like about early science fiction. Like, Rendezvous with Rama, like, I I was not quite sure who we're paying attention to or why we're paying attention to them. Mm. And it just didn't hold my interest in any way. Like, I'm I'm good for the big world-spanning thing and I'm good for the little thing, but it seemed to spend a lot of time in the middle. Hmm. And I couldn't tell what I should be caring about. I think an, a, 
in contrast to Juliet's book, where I've lost track of what the bigger arc is because I've gotten so sucked into the characters and what they're doing and why they're doing it and how they're doing it. And and to a huge degree, I, I you know, you get you step back into the larger world. They go, oh yeah, we're doing a thing. Aren't we? you know. <laughs> we're doing yeah. it. <laughs> we have air selection going on here, guys. Right. You know, I, I didn't care. I was caring about whether Nicantor was going to get bitten by somebody. So, <laughs> <laughs> still waiting, by the way. <laughs> okay, so, as yeah, we all dissolve you know. into, we all dissolve into spoilery laughter. <laughs> 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 but I think there's a lot poor of Morgan. Uh, so poor Morgan is left out here. I'm just saying. Okay, let's, let's, <laughs> let's, let's read it. No, honey, I'm gonna have to send you an arc or something. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh my god. But, <sighs> so this is the the problem we're looking at though is the opposite of um of what a lot of people end up with in terms of, of you know, elaborate world building is uh, the putting too much on the page. Mm. So mm. the balance there between putting enough on the page so that people know where they are and what's going on um, mm -hmm. and having some sense of background. Um, I'm really glad you brought that up, actually. It's, uh, um, when you are like, when you are machine gunning information at people, uh, it can be really hard for them to know what's important and what's not, right? Yep. Um. <laughs> yeah, and there's some that way it doesn't come to a, it doesn't come to a denouement that feels authentic mm. in any way. Um, Kim Stanley Robinson does that in um, the series of characters, 40 Sons of Rain. Mm -hmm. He does this whole long info dump at least twice on Aeolian hand axes, or ch Achulian hand axes, the, the first shaped shirt rocks that basically proto-humans were using to as knives. Mm -hmm. And it comes out that the reason he's telling you all of this is because the one character who's obsessed with a woman is going to use one of them to throw it at somebody and hit them in the head. And that's pretty much the whole reason that he brought this entire long discussion in. And I'm like, I, you know, could have used a snowball. Doesn't even matter. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, I, just think I see your so point. Long stuff that you got really involved in, and then it just didn't flow. Yeah, I mean, so because my uh, my personal strategy is the sort of less is more strategy, um, but I do get called on stuff. So, like for example, skimmers. I got called on skimmers. Like. Mm -hmm. Like you have them, you're using them a lot, but I have no idea what they look like. And I was yes. like, I am not going to stop out of my narrative in order to describe a skimmer. Oh, so what I did instead was I described a character interacting with the skimmer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah. that you could at least have some hints that, you know, it was a thing and it was open and you could sit in it and drive, or you could actually have the drive part lifted up so that you could stand and drive and somebody could sit behind you. And like, mm -hmm. I just didn't like, mm, you know, I'd rather do that in one spot and make an oblique reference to repulsion plates in another spot, mm -hmm. then sit you down and go, okay, so here's how skimmers work. Mm -hmm. um, because they're so incidental, right? Yeah. And yeah. Something just incidental, and, and, and that's interesting because different readers then will get will get the idea. But then my conception of what a skimmer looks like is probably very different than not only yours, but then probably different from Kate's. But I, I I kept thinking land speeder from yeah. Star Wars. That's, that's where my brain do. went. Okay, Tigris in a land speeder. Got it. Go for it. <laughs> If you haven't seen the Mandalorian, you get to see a couple extra different kinds of land speeders. I see. haven't yet, but yeah. 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 Um, some of it too, boy, that you can get away with anything in print, but I'm noticing the transition to screen is really hard because now I look <laughs> for stuff in the background. Like I'm looking at 
the Mandalorian ship, and it just has toggles that he's flipping. And I'm like, we haven't used those since Apollo. You know, you you think that there'd be some other interface. It's the same thing where when Riker sits down on the um, the control surface in the Enterprise, why is he not triggering a whole bunch of stuff with his butt? <laughs> <laughs> You know, my cat triggers stuff when he walks on my phone. So yeah, it's 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 it it gets really really difficult. It's it's kind of dicey about how much you explain and how much you let people infer, mm-hmm. um, and how you decide to explain that. And and I I run into the problem. I love info dumping. It's lots of fun. And I run into the problem of no one needs to know this right now. <laughs> You know, we need to know that this is some sort of forklift like thing. We don't need to know what the actual antimatter thing is. So, right. Yeah. So here's the question about skimmers, Juliet, is knowing now what they are imagining, mm-hmm. how much of a difference does it make to you and how much does of a difference does it make to them in reading the rest of the story? How far off that is from what you imagine? Well, it, you know, it's I mean, kind of an interesting just a question. question to ask. <laughs> I think, I think where you would get a divergence being important mm-hmm. is if you suddenly had somebody interacting with one in a way that somehow I felt was inconsistent with <laughs> the way that the machine I imagine works, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, since it's sort of a, a general transportation device Mm -hmm. and i don't care (laughs) now i mean this is this is a thing i i i acknowledge um that people are not going to have the same vision i have right Mm -hmm. um and and that doesn't bother me there was a time when i was like oh my gosh if somebody calls him aloran i'm gonna freak out (laughs) right because his name's a lauren Damn it. No, but like, <laughs> yeah. but my point being that at this point, I'm just going to acknowledge that people are going to see things differently from me and that's okay. Now, if I, if I later on, uh, you know, encounter people and they go, what's the proper way to pronounce A-L-O-R-A-N? I will tell them it's Aloran. And but Aloran. if I, if they want to say Aloran, I'm not going to stop them. I'm not going to be like, that's wrong. <laughs> And then that's interesting because the because the arc I just started starts with the pronunciation guide. Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, so the author really does care that you get it the way she she has it envisioned. So the mm-hmm. now we know that that if Juliet describes something precisely, so precisely that you two end up with the same image, it's because it matters to her. Mm-hmm. You come up with the same image that she's she has. I think so that's the thing to, to think about is if you find room. yourself dumping things on the page, um, which things are important to <coughs> you, which things are important to the story. Do you guys and, know about pragmatics? Do you guys know about the uh, cooperative principle of pragmatics? I'm not uh, sure okay. So, so basically the cooperative principle of, of, of pragmatics is basically this idea that that you're going to use the words that are going to be maximally cooperative. Now, this is obviously not always the case, but like that you won't give more information than is necessary or drastically less information than is necessary. Now, when it's, you know, a request for a pen, hey, can I borrow a pen? Like, (laughs) that's a lot simpler than saying, I'm going to write this novel, you see. but to some extent, I think it's worth acknowledging that people put words on pages for a reason. Now, it may be that it's just because, you know, dinosaurs are their favorite, favorite topic. And so they just want to have a lot of words about dinosaurs. But that's still a reason, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so my general purpose idea is to say, well, if somebody's taking the time to describe this whole thing, it's probably important in some way, right? 
It's it's the spotlight principle. Yeah, I think of it as the spotlight principle. If they're putting the, the spotlight more words on something, are on something, the more time you have to spend with it, right? And the more mm -hmm. time you have to spend with something, the more you want to invest some kind of importance in it. Right. I do have words that I just put out there and don't explain. They're the first instance of the word tunnel hound. I don't explain it at all. My mom was like, what? <laughs> You know, what's, what's a tunnel hound? I said, well, you know, I can tell you, you're going to see more about them later, but, but, you know, um, it was, it's just an insult in its first iteration. Right? And I don't want to explain that there. I just want to let the insult context stand on its own and, and have people go, okay, tunnel hounds, obviously a thing, but I don't need to know right now. Cause that's just an insult. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> um, but I think the the link between number of words and the amount of time um, and the implication of more importance is, is something that's important to point out, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, and because, and sometimes it changes while the person is writing. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think in turn, she introduces the concept of a watchware, like a watchdog, but it's a dragon. Mm -hmm. It's not quite a dragon. It's sort of a degenerate version of that really early <clears throat> when you kind of understand what they are and less live with them and the whole thing you don't find out for another 20 years of writing and books <laughs> that 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 was actually what the dragons were bred up from yeah i don't think yeah. Anne mccaffrey knew that when she started either mm -hmm. yeah that's probably yeah. that seems likely mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know what? That's the help helpfulness of just sort of putting stuff out there and then figuring out what it means later. Right. <laughs> right. Because when I invented Tunnel Hound, it was just an insult. Ah. And now it's a thing. Now that yeah, because we see we have we because see you actually the see robots. them. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and there's there are a couple of tunnel hounds that actually have names in book two. <laughs> oh wow yeah <laughs> one of them is a therapy animal oh cool yeah oh. okay well this is not super spoilery but like oh, so I'll, so i'll just put this out here it's it's aris and variga's therapy animal ah okay so she tells me absolutely nothing well but, exactly you know. <laughs> <laughs> what exactly <laughs> But but I'll I'll know soon because you're sending me an arc, right? Yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> it's on the internet. It's it's live. It's, it's you're committed. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was like, you know, what would you do, and and how would this work, and and um, and you know, and and we've talked about pets on the show too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and tunnel hounds are not pets. <laughs> they're they're working animals and mm -hmm. and so one of the things that happened was that developed a lot further so i'm getting into book two and i'm like all of a sudden i'm realizing that riga has this tunnel hound and it's his therapy animal so he really wants to keep it around past the time when normally tunnel hounds would be left to their own devices or used for something else right Mm -hmm. um and so then i was like oh why and then i was like oh claws <laughs> right? yep. because when they get to a certain age i realize oh yeah they're gonna have these massive digging <laughs> claws, right? um and that would be really inconvenient in your home mm -hmm. um but then of course that means that that helps me design Vriga's home mm -hmm. uh -huh. because his home is going to have to be a home that's going to be able to accommodate this animal and, and not be wrecked. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. It's so important to say yes to things that you didn't think you were planning on saying yes to. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I'm writing with another person on a project and I wrote through the end of the scene I really wanted to write. And then I got to the next, I, I stopped and left myself at the place where I wanted to start the next scene. And he went in and said, okay, well, he, I'm going to introduce these five other characters in the middle of this. And I was like, no. And I thought about it and couldn't write anymore. Mm. So I said, yes. Yeah. I went, okay, then, then these are the characters we have and we're going to go forward from there. 
And then I, I realized, oh my God, now we have the moment that we can do um, a Tanya Huff, which is we have an entire platoon now. And so here's all the people who are in training with you that you're going to go through training with. And this is really well established that people do mm-hmm. this. Um, but we're all going to learn to train together and, and all of that. And then we're going to get shoved into a situation where we all have to count on each other. And so, and then I was like, I cannot write all of these different people. So you're going to have to write at least half of these characters. And he's like, I... <laughs> like, okay, there we go. Consequences of your choices. <laughs> yeah. Thought you were getting away with it. No! <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. And, and for everything, for every word that you put on the page, there's all kinds of stuff that it's connected to. Right. Um, and so some of it is visible and some of it is not visible. So it's, it's worth having an awareness of that constellation effect. Right. So each word you see is connected to a whole bunch of words that you can also see, but also to a lot of things that you can't see in the reader's mind. Um, and so your ability to control all that <laughs> is not a hundred percent. Utterly frustrating a lot of the time. Well, it is. Mm-hmm. It can be very frustrating, but it can also be extremely exciting mm-hmm. because, yeah, because there's so, it's, yeah, it's just so cool. It's like I have cool powers. <laughs> powers right. of mind control. Yeah, exactly. Well, and I think the coolness is is directly connected to how much of a control freak you are. Because mm. I think sometimes for people who are like, well, I'm writing a novel because then I control everything that happens in there. And I'm like, oh, no, you don't. Yeah, like, mm. yeah. Mm. How optimistic of you. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Tell me how that works for you in the future, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. <laughs> and it, it's, it can be hard because there are things that, that you have to know about your world. But only so that you can know the few things that the reader needs to know. Right. And even and the most... It, that's, dedic- why you get the, um, that's why you get the iceberg effect. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You have to know a ton of things about the underpinnings in order to know how this one thing is going to instantiate in this spot. Mm-hmm. Right now, I'm designing a paper shop. Ooh. Yeah. It's cool. fun. I also have to know why this paper shop is not normal. <laughs> and you need to, you, you won't know that unless you know what a normal. And I shop. need to know what a normal paper shop mm-hmm. looks like. But nobody else does. Yeah, you just exactly. Need to know. Yeah, they just need to know that this one isn't, and you can do that by having a character note that it isn't, or you can show them what a normal one is. It's up then, to you. And but then show the yeah, this show the, show the, yeah. the off one. Well, decisions, I will say decisions. this: my my rule for myself is that. I cannot have anything new in a climactic piece, like really, really new. So if I need an environment that I want people to actually know the details of, Mm -hmm. rather than just have it pass by in a blur as you ran through the room, I have to introduce it before. And you do, do you do do that in Mazes of Power. The climactic scene takes place in the place we've seen a couple times before. You yeah, built up, I, I you build to up to that. Things in places where you, like, I try to foreground things in places where you're not in a hurry, so that when you are in a hurry, they're already in place in your brain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. That's, that's the other thing about controlling what's on the page. Because there are times when you don't want that explanation on the page. Mm-hmm. Because again, for that same reason that we were just talking about, more words equals more time equals more importance. And if you're running for your life through a room, you don't want to give any importance to mm-hmm. what the wallpaper looks like. 
Yeah, you get you got no time for that. You got to care about whether or not they're going to get to the place to do the thing or else. Yeah, so you, but you also, also need to know people. We need that. I I just read an entire book by somebody who will tell you what somebody's race is. It's set in humans, but. I don't know what anybody looked like. I don't know what any of the scenery looked like. I don't even know what kind of cars they were driving. I know nothing about what anything looked like. And it drove me insane. I'm sorry, Morgan, go on. Um, if you're running through a room, you know, running for your life through a room, you want to know where the furniture is so you don't trip over it. Yeah. And, you know, the, the wallpaper is relevant, but if that chair is new and you didn't see it, you'll trip <laughs> over it. You break yep. it up and they'll catch it and kill you. Same goes yeah. for animals a lot of the time, too. They may be where you don't expect them, like around your ankle. <laughs> you think? Or dropping on you <laughs> off the ceiling. Yes. Wrapping your leashes yeah. around your ankles. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's never happened to me. Nope. Nope. That's actually something I'm going to actually like put into something on purpose of you know, people who tend to leave stuff on the floor and then having to try and walk through in the dark. Mm -hmm. Legos. Yep. And then you get to you get to invent swear words at that point. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Well, we're five months five minutes after five, and this got really exciting and adventuresome right at the end. But thank you all Again. for that. That never happens. <laughs> it does though. Like we kind <laughs> of ramp up as we go. <laughs> but um. I'm going to uh, stop our broadcast. Thank you all for participating and thank you for your contributions. And we will um, meet next week though. Um, we should discuss uh, what the topic will be because I don't know yet. <laughs> all right. Roger, Roger. Thanks. Okay. I'm gonna, there we are. God bless.